It's in the roots, not the branches, that a tree's greatest strength lies. So put your roots down deep. That when the storms come, and they will come, you won't be conquered. Stand firm and be deeply rooted in his love. Good evening. Isn't it great to be in church? So good to see everyone. Just look around the room. I think the best looking people in George are in this service. Hey? Definitely. Really, really great to be in church and excited to be able to share with you part four of our series, Rooted. And I've absolutely loved just spending time in God's Word, looking at the subject, because there is so much to what it means to be planted in God, planted in His house, and making sure that we are rooted in a way that we will flourish into all that God's got for us. I'm going to start off by reading a lovely verse, an incredible verse actually, out of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, reading from verse three, and this is out of the New Living Version. It says, those who have sorrow in Zion, I will give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Those that have sorrow in Zion. So it doesn't talk about those that have sorrow, it talks about those that, will have, that have sorrow in Zion. I will give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. I will give them oil instead of sorrow, a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of no hope. Some translations say instead of depression. Then they will be called oaks that are right with God. That word oaks is a tree, not a guy. Sort of throw that out there. (laughs) They'll be called oaks that are right with God, planted by the Lord, planted by the Lord, rooted in God, planted by the Lord that He may be honored, that God may be honored. When we flourish in life, God gets the praise. It's all about God. It's all about living our lives in a way that'll bring glory and honor to Him. So we've got two trees here. They're not oaks, they're pine trees. Um, One is doing relatively well, very well, and the other one, not so good. And I'd ask you the question, which one represents your life? Well, I can tell you which one God wants your life to look like. God wants our lives to look like this. God wants, this is what God wants our life to look like. And when our lives are like this, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. And that's what we've read. And I love this verse because it talks about those who have sorrow in Zion, being in Zion. In Zion represents being in Him, in His presence, in His family, in His community, in His church. Those that are rooted and planted in God. And it doesn't say that God just gets rid of our sorrow. God replaces our sorrow with something. And that's a a key thought for what we're gonna be looking at this evening, how God replaces things and how we need to intentionally replace bad things with good things. And it's linked, this passage is linked to another passage that we started off the series, also in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 92. And this is what it says. The righteous flourish like the palm tree. They grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And we spoke about cedar trees and how cedar trees in Lebanon, they grow high up in the mountains in in difficult terrain, in environments where big trees shouldn't grow. Yesterday, I was actually running up on the mountain and I was running up above the tree line and there's there's fanboss up there, but there's no big trees up there. And then I ran down from the, the top and I ran down into the forest, into the natural forest and it's beautiful and there's big trees, but you don't expect the big trees to be on the top of the mountain because that's not where big trees grow because it's not conducive. The environment determines whether the trees grow there or not. But cedar trees are different. Cedar trees grow and flourish in spite of the environment. And that's what God's life, God wants your life to look like, that we would flourish in spite of our environment that it's not natural, it becomes something that's supernatural. 
because with us, those that are planted in God, that are planted in the house of God, that are planted in Zion, we flourish in spite of our environment. It becomes something that's supernatural and God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. When people look at our lives and say, how is it possible that that person can be happy? How is it possible they can be flourishing in spite of what they've been through? Then it says this, they are planted in the house of God. They flourish in the courts of God. In their old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. Showing that the Lord is upright, that he is my rock and that there is no unrighteousness in him, no unrighteousness in God. The book of Hebrews tells us that that we have faith in God, we put our faith in God because we believe that God rewards those who diligently seek Him. God is a God that rewards and He rewards us if we diligently seek Him. And when we honor in God and we put in God first and he, we experience the rewards of that in our life, it shows that God is upright and there's no unrighteousness in Him. In other words, our life is supposed to look like this because it shows that God is true. It shows, it shows the world, it's a display to the world that God is true. So this is what God wants your life to look like. This is what God wants every single person's life to look like. God wants every single person's life to flourish like this. God wants every single family to flourish like this. God wants this to be a description of what's going on on the inside. Your joy, your peace, your sleep is important to God. God's got a great plan for our lives. God's got a great plan for South Africa. Do you believe that? I believe God's got a great plan for South Africa. I believe God's got a great plan for Namibia. We actually have someone, France, you wanna stand up quickly? Yeah, hey, France. Francis from our, our live stream location in Vintuk. And we believe God's got a great plan for Vintuk. We believe God's got a great plan for Zambia. We believe God's got a great plan for the whole of Africa. We believe that. And we believe that God wants to use us, his followers, to see his plan become a reality. And we're seeing that. I mean, just this year, we launched a new church, a community church in Protea Park. Isn't that awesome? And so lives change. We're seeing people's lives go from this to this. That's awesome. It's amazing. So others may live. And so I'm super excited because on the 24th of this month, Sunday the 24th, we're taking up a special offering, a heart for the us miracle offering. And what we're asking you to do is not to give money, but to ask God if you should give money. That's safer, hey. So just to get it right, we're not asking you to give money. We're asking you to ask God if you should give money. And if so, how much you should give. And what that money is gonna go towards is gonna help us speed up the vision that God's given us as a church. So we're seeing incredible things happen. Protea Park, amazing. Wilderness Heights, amazing. Zambia, incredible. And that is because of your giving. But we believe God wants to accelerate what we're doing. And so we're trusting God for more resources to do that. So what we're asking you to do is just to go and pray and ask God how much he wants you to give, if he wants you to give. If he says no, don't give, that's cool. If he says give lots, that's also cool. (laughs) Is that good? So that's happening on the 24th. We're very, very excited about that. And Bonnie will share a little bit more about that later on. Last week we spoke about Luke, we spoke out of the book of Luke, Luke chapter eight. And this is where Jesus teaches once again about the condition of our hearts and what Jesus actually teaches there. He talks about about God's word and how God's word comes to us. God's truth, God's promises, His God's plans for our lives and how God, God's word comes to us as a seed and that seed comes into our hearts. And it either grows or doesn't grow. It either flourishes or doesn't flourish and it's determined by the condition of our heart. And whether or not that seed actually grows and produces fruit, whether that seed, God's promises, God's plans for our lives actually become the reality of our lives is determined by the condition of our hearts. And so what we said, we said last week, we made the statement, the only thing standing between 
where we are and the future God's got for us is the condition of our hearts. Because the problem is not with God, the problem is not with our circumstances, the problem is with the condition of our hearts. We get really, really good in this place, in this world, maybe not you, but maybe people you know, and if you know somebody like this, don't look at them right now. But we get really good at blaming circumstances, blaming situations, but this, but this, but this, but this. But God's word tells us that we're supposed to be like trees, cedars in Lebanon that that flourish in spite of our circumstances. And that's got to do with the condition of our hearts. So can you turn to a person relatively close to you and say, how's your heart? How's your heart? Because this is what it says. How's your heart? In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, says, above all else, above all else, above all else, above all else, above all else. I don't know how to say that. Above all else. Above all else. No, we're not saying that'll be terrible. Um, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Above all else. I love, I love movies about the old days. You know, like the soldiers and the swords and the shields and, you know. And when you watch movies like that, they're always like the cities and there's like this town or the city and they've got these, these walls around it. Very much like, like in the Bible days, they'd have these cities with walled cities and then they had these gates that be where people would come in and go out of the city. And then at the gates, you've got these, these soldiers and they've got these big shields and the swords and they're standing there. What they're doing is they're guarding the city gates. They're looking to make sure that only good people can come in and bad people can't come in. And that's exactly what this verse says. It says, guard your hearts. Like, be like, like that sentry, like that, like that soldier that's at the city gate of your heart and only allow good in and make sure bad doesn't come in. So guard your heart. Make sure that only good is coming in. Make sure that only good is coming in. The Apostle Paul teaches on this and he talks about this in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31. And I love what he says here. He says, get rid of of bitterness, of rage, of anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And then verse 32 is key. He says, instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. The key word is the word instead. Instead, so the way that we change bad behaviors or get rid of bad behaviors is not by trying to stop a bad behavior, but rather we rather replace a bad behavior with a good behavior. Very similar to that first verse that we read where it says God gives us a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, a spirit of no hope, a spirit of despair. And so that's what we have to do. We have to replace one thing with another. The way that you break a habit is by replacing it with a good habit. And instead of just trying to get rid of a bad habit, okay, help me not be angry, help me not be angry. No, no, we replace that with a good habit. We choose to be kind. We choose to be intentionally do good things and that's how we stop doing bad things. That replacement, the intentionality of it. Like if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with worry, if you find yourself lying awake at night and you're worrying about things, the easiest way to stop worrying is not just, okay, stop, let me stop worrying, let me stop worrying. I mean, if you, the more you think about stopping worrying, the more you're gonna think about stopping worrying and you're gonna be worrying. Yeah. You tried that, hey, it doesn't work, hey. What you need to do is you need to replace it with praise. So try this instead, like, okay, I'm worrying, I'm lying awake at night, let me intentionally start to praise God, make a list of all the things you're thankful for. God, I know that you're good. God, I thank you that, you got, that your promises are true. And remind yourself of all the promises of God. Remind yourself of all the things that God has done and intentionally replace the worry with praise and you'll find, <sighs> Yeah. 
Luke chapter eight, when, we, when we we're reading it, talked about in the time of testing, because we all have times of testing. We all experience times of testing, and it's in the times of testing that we have to be even more intentional about these things. It becomes harder, but it's even more critical. It's even more critical in the difficult times to praise God. In the difficult times, when we've experienced loss, when we're experiencing frustration, when things are not working out the way that we want. We've got this promise from God, but doubt seems to be keep on creeping in and, and our circumstances, what we're going through is like, ah, Oh, why is this happening? In the midst of that, we need to praise God. In the midst of that, we need to worship Him. In the midst of that, we need to be very, very intentional. I heard this statement that I just think is so true and so helpful, and it says this. It says, worship that hurts like hell heals like heaven. Worship that hurts like hell heals like heaven. There's lots of examples of this in the Old Testament. One of the, my favorites is, a, is this guy called Joseph. He's found the, the last few chapters of the book of Genesis. And if you don't know his story, I'd really, really encourage you to go and read it. Or maybe you do know a little bit about his story, just go read it again. It's, it's an amazing, amazing story about a young man that grew up in a, a largely very, not a largely, like a very dysfunctional family. Lots of brothers, half brothers, Dad had multiple wives, it was a chamorse. He was the favorite of his brothers, the older brothers, and his dad treated him as the favorite. He got special gifts at Christmas time, got this fancy coat. He didn't have to do all the hard labor. All the brothers had to do all the dirty work. He was put in charge even though he was the youngest, and God actually gave him dreams. God gave him a dream that he would actually be in charge of his family that his brothers would actually bow down and worship. And he thought this was pretty good. So he thought, he went and told them, hey, guess what? I've got a dream and you guys all bow down and worship me. How awesome is that? His brothers didn't like it very much. And you know, one day his brothers are out in the field doing all the hard work. His dad says, hey, just go check up on them and make sure they're doing a good job. So he goes to go inspect their work. They see him coming. Here comes that dreamer. So they think this is their chance. They catch him, beat him up, rip off his cloak. To think they're gonna kill him, they decide, no, let's rather make some money. So they throw him into a pit, take him out of the pit, and then sell him as a slave to Egypt. Goes off as a slave to Egypt supernaturally. Somehow, he ends up being in charge of Egypt during a very difficult time. And through his life and his wisdom and what God, how God uses him, he ends up saving Egypt from this devastating famine and saving his entire family and extended family. You don't literally get their lives get saved because of him. And later on, towards the end of his life, he's talking to his brothers and he makes this statement in Genesis chapter 50 that is just amazing. He says this, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended this for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You intended to harm me, but God intended this for good so that others may live. So that others, I think he was part of Hope Church, so others may live. <laughs> you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. So he's experiencing this. He's married, he's got children, he's got grandchildren, it's amazing. But I'm convinced as I look at his life that he wasn't saying this only when he was experiencing the benefits of his life. I'm pretty convinced he was reminding himself of the promises of God even in the time of testing. In the time of testing, there's this time when, when he's now sold as a slave and he ends up in this guy Potiphar's, as a slave to Potiphar. And Potiphar's this very, he's basically the, the guy that's in charge of carrying out all the dirty work for Pharaoh. And, and he's, he's serving as a slave in Potiphar's house. But he's, 
While he's serving, the Bible actually says that he's faithful in the little. Even though he's got these big dreams, he's never too enamored with his dreams. He's still faithful to do the little things. What a lesson for us. Even though we've got big dreams, let's be faithful in the small things. And he's faithful in the small things and then he gets promoted in part of his family and eventually he becomes in charge of part of his whole household. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 39, verse six. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Listen, if the Bible says you're well-built and handsome, you're well-built and handsome. I don't know if he had a six pack, I don't know. This guy was ripped. Well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told them, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house except, he, except every, everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in his house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? What's amazing is that this is before, before Moses, before the 10 commandments are given. And I think about where did he get this, this moral code from? Certainly not from his dad, certainly not from his brothers, especially Reuben, I mean, that's just what he was doing was. Where did he get this from? He wanted to be faithful in the little things. I'm convinced that even in this time, while he was slave, he was a slave, he was reminding himself, my brothers isn't intended this for harm, but God has got a plan in all of this. God's got a plan in all of this. God's got a plan in all of this. He was reminding himself of the promises of God even when he was going through this. Then she accuses him of rape and he gets thrown into prison again, but even in prison, he's faithful in the little things. He's faithful, faithful, faithful. He gets promoted and he becomes in charge of the prison underneath the main guy while he's still in prison. And then while he's in prison, he meets these two guys that were working for the Pharaoh, the baker and the cupbearer. And they get thrown into prison and they have dreams. And so they come and they tell him their dreams. And what's amazing is that he actually interprets their dreams. And this is what it says, it records this when when the cupbearer is actually relating the story to Pharaoh when Pharaoh had a dream, because Pharaoh is looking for somebody to help him with his dream. And so Pharaoh has a dream and the cupbearer comes to Pharaoh and says, hey, I had a dream and this guy helped me with my dream. Maybe he can help you with your dream. Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh was once again angry. This is the cupbearer telling Pharaoh, Pharaoh is once again angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the God. Each of us had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, the servants of the captain of the God. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dreams. There Joseph is in prison. God's given him dreams. But what does he do? He ends up helping people with their dreams. And the incredible thing is this, as he and because he helps people with their dreams, his dream ends up being fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? Like, I would like to think I would be like Joseph. But I might not be. Matter of fact, if somebody comes and tells me their dreams, maybe I would say, whoa, that's amazing. Let me tell you about my dream. But there's no record here of Joseph telling anybody in prison about his dreams. He just ends up listening to other people's dreams and helping them with their dreams. And as he lives to help other people with their dreams, his dream ends up being fulfilled. As he lives to help the cupbearer understand his dream, as he lives to help Pharaoh understand his dream, Joseph's dream ends up being fulfilled. When we live to be a blessing, we end up experiencing all of this. And so the two trees here are really the story of, of the condition of our hearts. 
When we live to be a blessing, this is what we get. When we live to try to be blessed, this is what we get. When we live to help other people with their dreams, this is what our life looks like. When we live to get, try to get people to help us with our dreams, this is what our life looks like. It's all about the condition of our hearts. It's the condition of our hearts. Can I encourage you? Can I challenge you to be as intentional as possible? The statement so other, others may live isn't just a tagline that we like to put up because, yeah, it's nice. No, it needs to be the mantra of our lives. We live so others may live. It's not about me. God, help me to take my eyes off myself. Help me to take the focus off myself. Help me to stop complaining. Help me to look instead of trying to be blessed. Help me to be a blessing. Even in my pain, even when it's hurting, God, help me. Even though it's hurting like hell, help me to take my eyes off myself and live my life as an act of worship. Because that's when I experience the breakthrough. That's when I experience God coming through and His promises becoming a reality in my life. Lord, help me. Help me. Would you stand with me to your feet? I'm going to take a moment to pray. And I, I'm not sure where you are. Maybe, maybe you're experiencing all the blessing of God and your life is flourishing. That's awesome. Don't, don't take it for granted. Continue even in the blessing. Continue to live to please others, to continue to love to be a blessing to God. Continue that your life will be an act of worship. But we need to guard our heart above all else. We need to make sure that we're replacing those ugly things in our hearts with Him and with what He wants and to be intentional about that. So I'm gonna pray and I encourage you to pray. And let's just ask God, God, Help us. Help me, Lord. Help me to live for you. Help me to honor you. Help me to take my eyes off myself and help me to worship you. In spite of what I'm currently feeling, in spite of what I'm currently going through, help me to live my life as an act of worship. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you so much for your truth. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you've got a great plan for me. Thank you, Lord, that I can live my life on purpose. Thank you that I can live my life as an act of worship. And Lord, I pray, Lord, we pray that you will help us, Lord, to live a life of praise, to live a life of worship, God, that will bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. We really pray that it, you find it helpful in your journey. And we also really want to encourage you to take your next step by signing up to join a small group or to do discovery. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this with as many people as possible. And we really can't wait to see you next Sunday.